Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And my guest is Todd Agnew, who is a musician and a theology student, right? I am, yeah. I do both, depending yeah. on what day it is. That's right. So, and, and you've been here a while now. I hear you're in your last year, so you're hitting your swan song. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah. Um, I'm starting to get a hold of a few of the ideas, and, uh, but, uh, you know. Well, be encouraged, because when it's all done, we give you a degree called a Master of Theology. I call it the greatest mis- misnomer of a degree that I've ever heard of in my life, you know, to be a Master of Theology. But it does mean that you mean know a little something, so hopefully we've done something for you there. Yeah, yeah. I definitely feel like I've started. Um, I'm on that journey, and uh, I'm definitely taking a few more steps. Um, I don't know that master is going to fit quite yet, yeah. but uh, it's been good. Well, good. Well, uh, let's. We're here to talk about music and truth and beauty and vocation and all those mixtures. Um, so let's start a little bit with your personal story. How did you get involved in music? And uh, tell, give us a little outline of kind of your background and what got you to Dallas. Yeah. Well. I- I was born here, so you know, coming back to school at DTS is a little surreal because I was born at Baylor Hospital, like you know, three blocks right, away. Yeah, wow. Um, so, so I started life here and grew up here in uh, the Dallas Metroplex, and um, you know, fell in love with music at a pretty young age. Uh, started leading worship pretty much uh, right as I left for college, hmm. and um, and stayed in that and. Just really, especially you know, youth camp, um, that kind of atmosphere. Really loved it, and uh, I did that for a long time. And years and years later, um, you know, when I would drive somewhere and you know play for a youth group of four people for you know pizza and gas money, uh-huh. um, you know, every weekend, um, I eventually uh, recorded a record that you know I was going to sell at camp and at my church. Um, but uh, one of the guys that turned into a mentor for me, uh, Dana Key, um, heard what we were doing and just said, hey, Todd, I think God has a bigger plan for this. Mm -hmm. And we prayed about it, and because I really didn't think that's what God was doing. He had taken a long time to kind of break the pride of being a musician Uh um, in my heart, so I I didn't assume he was going to take and do something real big with it. I I thought I was where I needed to be, but um, but Dana was patient and a godly man, and we uh, prayed through it, and got all of a sudden God opened these huge doors, and I was had songs on the radio. Was in a you know was in a tour bus traveling around, and um, had a great bunch of guys with me that um, you know was a, a big part of kind of what God did over those years in my life, um, and being being a part of their life and how they affected me. Um, and you know I've just kept doing that and uh, had had different opportunities, and so so by now you know it's. Well, sometimes it's jumping on a plane and going and you know playing a big band show with all the the lights and sound equipment and you know lasers and fog and everything, um, and sometimes it's just grabbing a guitar and, and leading worship in a church. Um, sometimes it's going and teaching um, the Bible. Sometimes it's uh, going and training the next generation of hmm. uh, people that are going to be doing this. And um, so it's it's really been a beautiful story so far. So how did you end up at the seminary in particular? Um, I – there was kind of two main things that happened. One is we had started a worship leadership development program at uh, Austin Stone Community Church down in Austin. Mm-hmm. And I was a part of that team. and and. I just saw we were we were doing a lot of really great things, and we were seeing these young worship leaders um, grow. But I was just convicted that I I felt like a lot of what I had to offer them was experience. Oh, there's this one time this happened uh-huh. in the service, um, and I had a few you know home run Bible verses about worship, but but a real solid foundation biblical theology of worship, 
I had an idea, but I like most of those things I pulled as, you know, quotes from mm-hmm. somebody's book. I and and I really just wanted to be more trained, more prepared to help them build the foundation for their future ministry. Hmm. And um, and so that was part of it. And then the other was my wife got a job offer up here. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and as we started talking about that, I was um, trying to be encouraging about the city of Dallas. And one of the things I mentioned that was a highlight in Dallas was DTS. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, do you want to go to seminary? I said, well, I didn't say that. (laughs) I just said it's a really good thing in Dallas. Um, You know, I really respect the work they're doing there. And she goes, yeah, but do you want to go to seminary? I was like, well, I mean, if you mean me and my heart of hearts, of course. I, I, I love studying the Bible, love understanding um, who God is and, and what He's doing um, in our lives and in the world. Um, but I, I'm a musician, you know, that, that's not been in the academic world. It's like, I don't think I get to do that. I was like, maybe someday, you know, retirement age, I'll get to come audit some classes. Hmm. But she really just encouraged me and said, I really think. Um, you know, that God's doing something here and you need to call them. And so I did and all, got lots of help and all the pieces got to come together. And uh, so I've had a, a great three years here. That's great. Well, you know, you normally, um, I guess, uh, one of the challenges of, of doing music and particularly writing music is, is thinking through the contents of what it is that you're engaged with. And, and so I would imagine that, that one of the challenges is thinking about um, what you're writing and and what it's saying and how it can be understood and that kind of thing. Um, have you found your time here to be enriching in that regard in terms of opening up the possibilities of what it is that you can write and sing about? It has been. Um, it's been a long process, though. Mm-hmm. Um, I was always very serious about what I wrote, and I tried to be very careful with the theology that that we present um, because it's very easy to say something not quite right. Mm-hmm. And uh, and if you put a catchy tune to it, a lot of people suddenly might know something that's not quite right. <laughs> right. And, um, and so I was always very cautious about that. Um, and it was very important to me. And so that's really, I thought I would come here and I'd just boom and explode with, you know, I'd, Isaac Watts, you know, writing all these great, <laughs> rich things. Uh-huh. And instead, I did the opposite. Mm-hmm. I got here and I stopped writing songs altogether. Huh. And, uh, and at first, I thought I was afraid. Mm-hmm. I thought that I had gotten kind of um, stage fright of, oh, I, now I see how much there is to know, uh-huh. and I know how little I know, so I, maybe I just shouldn't even risk writing a song. But fortunately, I had some really, uh, had great community around me that we started talking and wrestling this mm-hmm. idea. And what we came to was that fear is a little bit of it, mm-hmm. but that. A majority of it is that my writing process is really long. Hmm. I I songwrite usually over about eighteen to twenty four months. Oh wow! Um, that the seed kind of gets planted, and I start wrestling with it scripturally, then theologically, um, then communally, and we uh, you know we start talking about it. Mm-hmm. Then say okay, well then how do we live that out? And once it's kind of been in my life for a while, mm-hmm. that's when it turns into music. Once it's a natural part of life, I hmm. write a song out of it. Um, but uh, what happened here was I had so much going in the front end of the pipe yeah. that nothing was getting to the end of the pipe because yeah. I was always – There wasn't the time to process what you were getting. Not at all. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, we got to have those conversations and – um, and so I realized that, hey, during my time here, I'm going to have to be intentional mm-hmm. and take some of those things and go, hey, this one's – I've got to drag this one to the end. Uh-huh. And, uh, and so that's kind of the approach I've taken for the, about the last year and a half now is starting to go, okay, this one, we're going we're gonna to get it through the process, and I'm gonna, I've got to keep drinking out of the fire hydrant, but uh-huh. we're going we're gonna to get some of these things through and um, – 
and the things that have come through ha- have been really rich and mm. uh, really beautiful, and uh, I'm honored to be a part of it. It's it, it's interesting because as you're talking about this, I and I actually honestly had never thought about this before, is whether uh, you write first and then go to the tune, or do you have a tune and work words into it? Uh, do you have a set way that that works? I. I well, I was gonna say I don't, but I probably do. Um, I've found that the great thing about being a musician and being a writer is that you get to be friends with other musicians and other writers. Mm-hmm. And um, th- one of the beautiful things about being a songwriter as opposed to a book writer is that songwriters then you get to play your songs and then you go on tour with your friends that play songs mm-hmm. and write songs so you you build that um whereas you know a lot of times some of my friends that write books they they do that all by themselves That's in exactly a little right. room. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but i get to see everybody else's creative process and mm-hmm. see kind of how they operate and um and the honest truth is i i know guys that work all those different ways hmm. some of them have tunes and and carve out the the words to be on top of them some of them are you know more poets and then put the music to it i i'm this long process person so for me, it's always the scripture. It's always the theology that's the real inspiration, the real seed. And as it grows through life, eventually, as a musician, that's just the language it comes out in. Mm-hmm. And when it does for me, it's it comes out almost done. You know, mm. it's it's the the tune and the words come out together for me Hmm. um, in one moment. But, you know, like I said, as we've been taking this a little more seriously, looking at um, what songs can be written for the church in the last couple of years, um, now that has, hey, look, this is what it's going to be like, and okay, so now we need to stop. (laughs) Now We've we've got the vibe. Here's Uh here's where the song's going to go, but let's not just throw words in it. Let's Mm -hmm. find what what's the theology that really – what's the best thing that can be said mm. in the third line of verse 2? Mm-hmm. You know, where normally by the time I'm the third line of verse 2, I'm just going. <laughs> this kind of rhymes here. You know? uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, but now we're saying, no, we're, we're talking about redemption, what happened on the cross. Mm-hmm. So what, what can be said in these – seven syllables what's mm. the best thing that that can be uh, you know returned as an offering to the lord um in that moment and so it's it's really been challenging and really been a, a but a, a beautiful kind of new season now do you write your songs on your own or do you have a team that you kind of interact with or how does that work um for a long time i wrote by myself mm-hmm. um i've pushed myself in the years uh, more recently to write with others. Um, one, because I, I think the body of Christ does beautiful things together. Um, but also, you know, selfishly is, well, what if you have a better idea for this than I, you know, yeah. I, I, I think I, it's kind of a little bit that I kind of know what my songs are going to do uh-huh. right now. I've done this a long time. Uh-huh. I, um, they're they're gonna lean this direction and they're gonna say kind of these things and I'm gonna push myself. Where whereas man, when you bring somebody else into that, it can it can really spark something I would have never thought of and never hmm. tried that. And um and so that's um that's a lot of fun. So so you d- you've both led music in a church and done the concert thing and you're now doing a little bit of both. Yeah yeah I. I probably have too many hats on right now, mm-hmm. you know, just looking at life in general. Because, <laughs> um, you know, I'm a husband and a father and um, – Oh, and, by the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and so, so there's, you yeah. know, my, my primary package. Uh-huh. And then I'm trying – I'm doing all these other things on the side. Um, and so, so yes, yeah, so, so I still um, go out and um, play concerts. I don't do a lot of the big crazy shows anymore mm-hmm. just because – I don't know that I need to. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of other great bands that can do that mm-hmm. just as well or better than I can. So I try to, uh, you know, be home with my family and then take the shows where, hey, look, I I think what they're doing ministry-wise, 
um, I could really be a part of and I could really add something to you. And, uh, and so sometimes um, that's by, uh, you know, playing my songs, uh, more concert stuff. A lot of times it's by going and leading worship. Um, and in fact, almost all the time, it's some kind of combination of those two. Mm-hmm. You know, even concerts, uh, I'm a worship leader. Mm-hmm. That's, it's gonna, that, that's gonna be a part of what we do. But I'm also a Bible teacher and a storyteller. So by now, it's, I've, I've got the freedom. I've done this long enough, and um, people have believed in me long enough that they kind of come in and they just say, hey, look, we want you to be who God has made you to be and just share with us. Hmm. And uh, so it's, it's a really fun time right so, now. So you've lived in Houston, and you've been here in Dallas, and, that, and I think I heard you were in Austin for a time. Mm-hmm. So um, how much does the I'm, – I'm just asking odd questions here, but how much does the city that you're in impact – um, what you are, because I mean, if you're talking about three cities in Texas, um, Austin, Dallas, and Houston, uh, they're pretty different places. Um, yeah, they are very much so. And and the the other big chunk of life in between all that was I spent six years in Memphis. Ah, so there's another uh, really iconic. Oh yeah, sure. Um, sounding mm-hmm. place, um, and Dallas is metropolitan enough that mm-hmm. I don't. I don't know how much it really affects me, but at the same time, it's home, so I might not notice the influence that it has on me. Um, I didn't really notice as much in Houston either, but when I left Houston and went to Memphis, uh-huh. it it changed um, how I listened to music, how I played, hmm. um, and uh, how I understood some things, and it really shaped, and so that happened. Um, I. The Grace Like Rain record, the the big one that started mm-hmm. all this for me, um, I recorded it while I lived in Houston, but I was doing ministry weekly in Memphis, flying huh. back and forth. And so in between the time I recorded it and the time it came out, I had moved to Memphis to play in a church. Huh. So, so those first few records um, are – like the first record is just, hey, this is me growing up in Texas. This is kind of <laughs> yeah. who, I, who I am. But even just by the second record, you can already hear Memphis and the the effect it's had on me, and just kind of going, oh, this is this is kind of home. There's uh-huh. something about this resonates with me that nothing else has. And I loved the music there, and you can see the uh, the effect it had. But then. Getting married and turn around and coming back to Austin uh, had a big effect too, and kind of for the first time, Texas and its style of music wasn't something that's hey that's that's how I grew up. I don't want to be that. Mm-hmm. It was uh, hey this is home and I want to embrace this. And I I grew into Texas music that's um, interesting. being a Texan, and it's, it was a lot of fun. see. I, I I it would seem to me you know, I'm a I'm a University of Texas graduate, so I've lived in Austin myself, and I was living in Austin when Willie Nelson was you know kind of the icon of the right. city. Um, and, and although I'm not a big country western person, there's so much um, country western feel to some of of Christian music that we hear. Um, uh, you know, I would I would assume that that would be a pretty big influence. I actually was going to ask you if you'd spent much time in Nashville as opposed to Memphis, just thinking about the the southern roots and and how many. Christian artists do gravitate at one point or another to Nashville. Um, uh, so, so, so you have a sense that that at least two of these cities really did impact the way uh, you've ended up writing your music. It did. It did. Um, just you know, seeing um, seeing how those people expressed themselves and mm-hmm. expressed their lives, um, and uh, you know, in Memphis, obviously, it's a blues heritage. Um, coming back to Austin, um, fortunately, it was still a blues heritage, mm-hmm. and kind of you know the the Texas country, mm-hmm. not the pop country, right, right. but uh, um, and both of those are really honest and authentic mm-hmm. um, musical styles. They're mm-hmm. both fairly raw um, lyrically. They're both um, put kind of put your heart on the table, mm-hmm. um, which was really who I was. Mm-hmm. And so um, getting comfortable in both of those really, you know, kind of opened the door for me to um, 
uh, to write in those styles and to uh, uh, to find ways I was comfortable being me as a musician. So um, the, the, again, I'm, the, these questions are just hitting me as as we're talking very much. Um, so, do you find yourself writing uh, ideas, stories mixed together? I mean, how do you how do you view that part of it, or does it just it kind of depends. I think basic. I think at heart, I'm a storyteller, mm-hmm. and I would love to be the clever singer songwriter mm-hmm. that writes those songs, the David Wilcox mm-hmm. that you just go, ah, oh, that line, I that expressed everything I've ever felt. Um, but I'm just not that writer. Mm-hmm. Like I would love, I would love to be that guy, and and I write a song like that every once in a while, um, but. Most of my stuff is that it's honest. It's oh, here's where I am, mm-hmm. and there's who God is, and He is with me in this. And something about that combination, that interaction, is where most of my stuff comes from. And mm. so it's not life changing. It's not brilliant. It's not something that somebody goes, God, I've never thought of that before. Mm-hmm. But I've found that over time, a lot of people have said, yeah, but I've, I've felt like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so I think God has allowed me to, to be a part of people's stories in that way. Uh, it, it, it's interesting to hear, hear, the, hear this kind of up close and personal as you, as you wrestle it. I mean, some people think that the songwriter just gets up there and they're, they're gifted and they play a tune and they, the words pop in their head and it kind of all happens all at once and that m- great moment of – you know, of what two minute inspiration, mm-hmm. and and that doesn't sound like that's your world. It's not. Am I cause one? But just because my writing process is so long, it's mm-hmm. not like that. Um, but even I don't know that it's really like that for anybody. Even mm-hmm. if you write quickly, mm-hmm. um, it's still this is part of you and mm-hmm. part of your heart and your walk, and it's not really. Hey, I, I made this, and I wanted to see if you liked it. It, mm-hmm. it. You know, you've you've sewn part of yourself into that, which is the difficulty of it being a business. Mm-hmm. You know, you do a hit record, and then you come back, and you, it's like it's like we starting, want more. Yeah, yeah, it's like starting yeah. junior high for the second time with no friends. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, I had friends last year, but I don't know if they're going to like me this year. Yeah, uh, yeah. But you've written yourself into that and your story into it, and so um, it's a wonderful and beautiful thing. But yeah, it, it can it can be difficult as well. How is life as an artist in the church? I mean, is is it is it inspiring? Is it sometimes feel confining? I mean, it seems to me you'd be bouncing back and forth to a certain degree in terms of of what you can do and and what maybe you can and and yet uh, you know how does that sort that out maybe I've got that completely wrong no it's um, it's a complicated issue mm-hmm. um, and I think like most issues it varies from church to church hmm. and from person to person um, and and really, you know, as I as I've been looking at it recently, it it varies from art form to art form. Hmm. Um, I you know spent some time last semester with a lot of visual artists, hmm. and their experience in the church. They would share this is kind of what I've struggled with in church, and and I had to I had to finally tell them I'm like, hey, look, I I feel for you. I'm I'm listening. I understand the words you're saying, but you also need to understand that you're not talking to somebody in exactly the same position Mm -hmm. because music is much more integrated into church life than visual art. That's true, yep. Um, And I was like, and so we're – some things you can say, well, people, you know, don't understand. They don't support. And like, I I have hit records. And Mm -hmm. I was like, and I'm I'm sympathetic to you, but I don't want to – I don't want to be pretending that I'm in the same spot as you because I'm not. Mm-hmm. Um, but we got to have some really great conversations, and that does it did make me look back at at art at music additionally as art, and um, and it is a different. Um, it's an unusual circumstance because uh, I, I don't remember if you just said it right now or, or earlier, but that there is this kind of. Push pull mm-hmm. relationship with the church that sometimes oh 
the love. This is the best thing. This God did something I've never seen. It's the most wonderful thing I've ever experienced. Um, but then you can go one step farther or just somewhere a little different. And way I'm not not sure if we can do, do that. this. Yeah. And and the thing is, theologically and uh, methodologically, you know, as a pastor, mm-hmm. you kind of say. Hey, that that's a fair question. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if something's new, you should test it and, mm-hmm. and ask questions. Um, but uh, it's it's been good um, to be at the seminary for me for the last year, really, and having conversations of risk and creativity mm-hmm. versus theology, where we kind of have a tendency to minimize risk we're, we're trying mm-hmm. to dial it down to what's actually right mm-hmm. and in creation we're usually trying to expand and see what's out there mm-hmm. and they're really different processes and mm-hmm. they're both valuable mm-hmm. well I mean, in, in the 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 variety of expression that's available on the one hand versus um, the you know the the base that you're dealing with in theology that they they do kind of bump in they can bump into one another pretty easily. Uh, I, I imagine, Todd, looking at you that 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 you were in the church and beginning to do your music at a time in which you know and we don't talk about that as much as we used to. At the worship wars were mm-hmm. going on and the the choice between style of music was a big deal. And of course, you talk about running into people with different tastes and particularly communities. Uh, that becomes important. Um, were you in the middle of that, and did you? How did you negotiate your way through that through that issue? Well, I I was a kid through that, mm-hmm. so I I watched it happen, not really knowing it was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, going, hey, you know, we used to sing, you know, four hymns. The first, second, and last stanzas. I never knew why we skipped the third stanza, but we did. Um, you just yeah. don't sing number three, right? Um, and you know, then all of a sudden, well, now we're also going to sing. Uh, you know, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Uh-huh. While we're shaking hands, but that's the only place for it. Uh-huh. And then you know, and I, so I watched it move as a kid uh-huh. um, to the point where I was in high school and word. Um, released a new hymnal mm-hmm. that had some of the, oh. the choruses in it, and you know, for the young people, we're like, yeah, so this is like the <laughs> awesome, is ours, the rock, yeah, the rock hymnal, <laughs> yeah. which it wasn't at all, but yeah. it was, you know, it was a company saying, hey, the church is changing, and we want to um, include that, um, but as a kid, I didn't understand what was going on nationally mm-hmm. you know on, mm-hmm. on that um, I became a part of it um, at the end of it as I started leading and you know took a band to camp mm-hmm. and they went um drums uh, how about if we just don't mic them and they kind of stay off the stage? Oh, the thing I get a kick out of, I actually do. I actually have an introduction to some of my sermons where I talk about the drummer who's caged because they always oh, put yeah. him behind this glass thing. And I've heard the explanations for why that's done for the sound and all mm-hmm. that. That may all be true, but I think it's a wonderful metaphor right. for, for for the way we view drummers. And uh, uh, in, in the church that I'm in, I mean, I'm very closely sided with two churches, but in one of the churches that I'm in. And they have drums, but it's all electronic, and it's all right. very controlled and muted. And and and, and so you know, so uh, sometimes I'll begin and I'll talk about you know, um, uh, I'll talk about this caged person that's back there in the band who we who we like to see, but we're not quite sure what to do with you know that kind of thing. Yeah, we, we can we can control with the fader exactly how much impact they can have on the service. Right. So we can turn them up and down a little bit. We actually played. Um, at a church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, one morning, and we're just going along in our first song, and all of a sudden the drums just went away, mm-hmm. and and then they came back in, but they didn't sound quite right. Uh-huh. And so I trust my drummer; he's one of my best friends. And so I, 
I just kind of kept going, uh-huh. and then I finally cut my eyes to look over there, and he had he was in one of the cages, uh-huh. and the roof had caved in on him. Oh wow! And he's holding up the roof, still <laughs> just playing. <laughs> uh, but you know that's that's the roof of the cage. You mean the, the, the cage? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and so you know, it was this hilarious moment. But it is one of those things that you don't. You don't see that in other environments, mm-hmm. and part of it's you know sound. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, um, but you know I think I think you're right. It, it's a great visual mm-hmm. metaphor for well, h- how do we really deal with this? How does that fit into what we've always done? What these are the things we're comfortable with and know that we're fairly confident that all of this is right mm-hmm. and. We think we probably should be adding this, but we don't know quite how to to mix those, and and I think we're still taking that journey to to some extent. So so how do you? You're an artist, and you go obviously go into a lot of different venues. The uh, one of the things I can tell you doing the the preaching side of this is different venues are different. They mm-hmm. you know different communities are different. Their expectations are different. Uh, how do you negotiate that part of, of interaction with worship in the church as an artist as you move from place to place? Do you, I'll tell you what I do as a speaker is I do spend some time talking to the staff that I know or the people who've invited me about the makeup of the church before I ever get up to speak so I have some sense of what the audience is about. Mm-hmm. Um, is it similar for a musician? It is. It is. And for us, uh, you know, we got we got thrown from being always the worship leaders Mm -hmm. to then all of a sudden we're on tour with all these guys, Mm -hmm. you know, and big bands. And it was a really abrupt change for us. And, and me and my guys really had to talk through it and pray about it. And, uh, unfortunately we kind of walked through it and said, well, who's God made us to be? What were we doing before all this happened? Mm -hmm. Like, well, we were, we were pastors. Um, you know, we weren't the pastor, but we were shepherding people, mm-hmm. and we went, oh, okay, we can do that mm-hmm. out here. Mm-hmm. And it's a really different environment and a different way to do it. But once we kind of made that shift, um, it really helped us a lot. And it helped me now going still from church to church because – now everybody knows different songs and has different ideas of what it should be and what styles. Um, but just to go in and say, hey, look, my job is to help shepherd these people. Mm-hmm. So that's what I want to accomplish more. I'm going to use whatever art can accomplish that the best today. Mm-hmm. Um, so so it's, a, it, it's, a, it, it's adopting a mentality that says that – the music that we do it is ministry in a very real sense, and we need to think about it that way. Uh, and 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 I you know I don't know how to how you put the the yarn that's the entertainment or the attraction of it around that, but but um, you know it's interesting. Speakers have similar choices mm-hmm. that you know. Uh, do I just just the facts, ma'am? You know, <laughs> you know the kind of the old dragnet thing of of Jack. Or just give me the facts. Just give me the raw biblical data. And how much do you rhetorically um, dress that up and 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 make it engaging for people so that there's there's something for them to kind of hook them and draw them in, particularly if they're – I like to talk about speaking this way. I don't know if music works this way, but I, I say there's 20 percent of the people, doesn't matter what you do or what you say, you got them. They're, they're mm-hmm. there and they're highly motivated. There's another 20 percent probably sitting on the edge, and you're going to have to work pretty hard to get those people. But it's that bulk in the middle, the 60 percent that can be swayed you know, to be engaged or be disengaged, that's, that's the major part of your mm-hmm. audience that you're, that you're playing with. And I I imagine in in music where you've got these different tastes and styles that it's almost can think about an audience in in that kind of a way in some ways. Yeah, definitely. So um, as an artist, you know, I I built a relationship with a guy that um, I don't even know what his job title really is, but he teaches people how to do the big shows of music. You know. Mm-hmm. The, um, Okay, you know, 
if at this point in the song, if you'll lean back to back with your guitar and yeah, yeah. play this, everybody's going to go crazy. Yeah. And, and we actually got to be friends because he walked up to me and he goes, Todd, I really enjoy what you're doing. I really like your music. And I know you probably hate what I do. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great introduction. And I'm like, all right. Okay, good. Because that, that yeah. seems kind of fraudulent to yeah, me. It yeah, seems a, yeah. seemed a little weird. Yeah. But I got to know him and saw how much thought and learning he had put into how you connect with the audience with all yeah. like especially that 60 percent right right um, how do you draw them in where do you find connection points he's like so you know your first song they're not there mm -hmm. your second song they're thinking about it so you want your big song mm -hmm. to be third hmm. and i was like you want your big song to be wherever the Holy Spirit wants it to be. <laughs> and you know, that was, that's how I felt. Uh -huh. And then I, over the years, I was like, yeah, but probably most of the time, a third slot's pretty good. That's, yeah, yeah. Most of the time, he'd, you know, he'd put so much learning into this and really understood how to connect with those people. And, and so I learned a lot from just watching his understanding of connecting to people. And then in preaching, you know, we do the same thing. Is mm -hmm. how I if I have to connect this truth, I have to get them to listen to it. That's so right. At some point in time, I have to help them receive that. Um, you know, and, and so whether that's you know the story, whether uh, you know in our classes it's the need. What? Mm -hmm. Why do you need mm -hmm. to hear this? And uh, you know, all that's true. And then as a worship leader. You know, this is what we're just kind of. I'm just in the last year. I've started taking these things with my team in Houston now, uh -huh. and saying, "Okay, let's start having these conversations." And we use the phrase "access points." Uh -huh. How, where are the places in our service where we can help people that may or may not be connected yet to connect into what's going on, mm -hmm. rather than say, "Hey, we're going to start," and good luck. Yeah, right. You, know, you can either come with us from the beginning. You're like, no, that's that's not how you lead. It's it's because there's different people coming from different places and different stories, and 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 so we're having those conversations even now. Of, mm -hmm. You know, just looking at a Sunday and saying, hey, you know, what is this? Well, we've got a lot of these great new songs, um, but what if we do Amazing Grace right here? Mm -hmm. Because that. That allows this generation mm -hmm. and these kinds of people that only come sometime that it, it allows them a way in. Yeah, well, I know what to do here. Yeah, um, exactly. That's, that's, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> here, I remember. Uh, I'll tell the story. This goes back to my first day in class at Dallas Seminary, and we're yeah. in we're in Prof Hendrix's Bible Study Methods, and he breaks out a song. Uh, my hope is built on nothing less mm -hmm. uh, Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I, I came to faith in uh, in college, so I didn't go to a Bible right. college. Where I didn't have I didn't have this hymnal mm -hmm. of of uh, of hymns that I knew. And you know, there were no words. There were there was nothing to guide me. I didn't know the song, and I felt totally disconnected to what was happening in the mm -hmm. class. Um, uh, yeah, I was really a newbie, and. Um, and I, you know, I think that sometimes we're slow in our construction of worship. This can be again, this can be music, or in our in the way we talk theologically. I often tell my audiences, theology is a foreign language to a lot of people. You got to do a lot of translating to to do really good connecting. And uh, and I, I think sometimes we're tasked in the church. Um, to to help people, I like that word access point. To help people kind of get on board, because they look at it and they go, "I don't recognize that train," <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, I don't know if I want to step on. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really true. Um, you know, that's one of the things that we're looking at right now. Just how do you um, how do you connect with all those people that are coming from so many different places? Um, you know, the song that that blew all the career up for me um, was a song called Grace Like Rain that it's 
it's just amazing grace mm-hmm. you know, with a new tune and a chorus. Mm-hmm. So it's not, I wasn't doing a lot of theological groundbreaking work uh-huh. here. Um, but I wrote it with one of my best friends who, um, like you, didn't grow up mm-hmm. with that body of work, that mm-hmm. those songs. And so as I was teaching hymns, to seventh graders at our church, mm-hmm. helping them going, okay, so when you say, here I raise my Ebenezer, right. this what is in what the world about. is that? You know, yeah. That's not picking up an old guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> right. Here's, uh, you know, so I'm wrestling with all this stuff, trying to help enrich their understanding of mm-hmm. worship. Um, but Chris came in and said, I-, I really like some of these songs, but I didn't grow up in church, and the music, I just don't connect with it at all. Mm-hmm. And so he had, he's like, I, so I took that Amazing Grace song, and I, I put a new tune to it. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I, don't, I don't know if you can do that. That might not be a good idea. And Isn't then, that in the New Testament? Yeah. So he, he played it for me. I was like, oh, that's oh, there is something special there. So I wrote the chorus for it, and we used it, and we saw that the words were still so powerful, mm-hmm. but people that had never been to church connected to the music in a different way because mm-hmm. they're like, oh, that's my kind of music. Mm-hmm. But people that had been going to church actually had to pay attention to the words because they couldn't sing it on automatic anymore. That's right. And it made them have a new experience with th- this great lyric and this great truth um, from years ago. And uh, and and uh, it was really you know this wonderful experience that we got to be a part of. You know, I, I you put your hands on something that I hadn't thought about before till you're talking about it now, and that is there are now lots of hymns that are handled this way that mm-hmm. where you take the words that are well known <laughs> and, and sometimes reflecting in English that we never speak anymore, right? And, and and putting them to a different tune, and sometimes even weaving the old style of the music mm-hmm. into the new style of the music so that you're 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 connecting the past with the present uh, style and keeping the words, and it or uh, another genre that we've seen more recently to kind of, and I think some of this has softened some of the tension, is um, taking um, a well-known hymn and singing it, and then connecting it to a chorus or something mm-hmm. like that that has the same theme but expresses it in a little different way, and using the two as almost a medley on and off of each other in such a way that that the demographic issues that sometimes come with the different styles of music both both sides get their time, right. <laughs> if I can say it that way. Yeah, I think it is, and it allows. Um, I th- I think it helps um, one generation um, feel that the next generation isn't disrespecting their heritage. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, but they're also trying to find their own way, their mm-hmm. own expression, um, and and it it does those songs. I love those songs. I play I almost too. all of those songs. I do too. Just yeah. because I love for the church to be able to sing together, mm-hmm. and kind of the only the only time the church can sing together nowadays is at Christmas. Mm-hmm. It's the only time we all know the same songs. Because mm-hmm. otherwise, you go from church to church, and well, we've picked up these new songs. We picked up these new songs. We don't do any new songs. We we do the and it's it's hard because there's not this unified. Um, you know, there's. There used to be a hymnal mm-hmm. that you denomination denomination it would change, but the core songs were all still in all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so as somebody like me, I could come in and play. Oh, I can play these songs, mm-hmm. and everybody's going to know them. Um, but it's not like that anymore. And and so I, I love one. I just love the heritage of those songs of intentionally um, connecting to those. But also, there's a reason that they're st- that they've been effective for so long. Yes, um, you know it's the same as the creeds. Mm-hmm. There, there's a reason um, that you know that that they were repeated for so long. Um, it's because a ton of godly work went into putting them together, mm-hmm. and they're brilliant, you know, um, expressions of our belief in who God is, and and then so now we. Even now, you know, we see uh, 
This I Believe, a new song by Hillsong, mm-hmm. which takes the creed and yeah, puts it into music. Yeah, absolutely. Powerfully wonderful. done. Yeah. Yes, powerfully done. Uh, we we're almost running out of time. I want to ask you one more question. I want to be sure and ask this before we get done, and it's this. How much commentary do you give to linking together what you're doing versus just letting the songs speak for themselves? I've heard different uh, approaches to that question as well. What's your thinking on that? Um, I... I I have a vast range of what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, I am a teacher, mm-hmm. and so I I naturally will do a lot of linking and teaching. Um, but if a number of years ago, we we just had a summer where um, the band guys and I really felt that we needed to lift Christ up and let Him reveal Himself, and we needed to not do anything else Hmm. and that was a really special year for us um and and it taught me that i don't have to force everything Mm -hmm. um that that god will woo the Mm -hmm. the hearts of those that he wants to worship him and so so now i do it as a kind of combination just Hmm. of of always trying to ask hey is there something I can say here that will really exhort the body, that will really help us. And if not, I can trust them and trust him to accomplish um, what he wants. Well, well, Todd, I really do appreciate you taking the time to come in and just talk and chat a little bit with us about art and music and truth and beauty and how that all goes together and how the church sometimes, you know, hugs it and sometimes wonders, you know, what to do with it. But it's it's amazing. Um, to see uh, someone uh, with your talent uh, put together the gifts that God has given you and use it so positively for the church. So we appreciate that very much and appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about it. And we thank you for being a part of The Table and hope you'll be with us again soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well. Thank you.